Hello, everyone. Welcome to the Lymphoma Research Foundation's update on Hodgkin lymphoma webinar. I'm Hope Avalone, and I'm the Senior Program Manager of Patient Education here at LRF. During today's call, you'll hear from an expert speaker and you'll have an opportunity to ask questions. Um, if you do have questions during the presentation, you can ask them at any time in the Q&A box. Any question that you submit to the Q&A box can be made anonymous and we'll get to as many questions as possible at the end of the presentation. And as a reminder, the webinar is being recorded. At the end of the program, a link will appear on your screen. Please follow this link to complete the program evaluation as we do incorporate your feedback into future programming. But for now, let's get started. Thank you again to each of you for taking the time to join us on today's webinar. And we'd like to start by thanking our sponsors, Genentech and CGen. And before we begin with the program, I'd like to share some additional information about the Lymphoma Research Foundation. First, we're the nation's largest nonprofit organization to, that focuses specifically on lymphoma. And our mission is to eradicate lymphoma and to serve those touched by the disease. All of our work is led by our scientific advisory board, which is a group of 45 leading lymphoma experts from around the country. And in today's in addition to today's program, we have a variety of other programs and services available to you. One example is our LRF helpline, which serves to complement our patient education programs. The helpline has master's level trained staff who provide individualized information on all types of lymphomas, as well as information on treatment options, clinical trial navigation, and connections to resources such as financial assistance. We also offer a peer support program called the Lymphoma Support Network. Through the Lymphoma Support Network, or LSN, we connect patients and caregivers with others who have been through similar experiences for emotional support. In addition, LRF has free comprehensive disease guides and fact sheets, including a fact sheet on Hodgkin lymphoma, which can be ordered or downloaded on our website, lymphoma.org. We also offer a variety of other in-person and virtual educational programs so that you can continue learning about the latest updates throughout the year. And finally, we have an award-winning mobile app called Focus on Lymphoma. The app provides helpful disease content as well as unique tools to help you better manage your lymphoma. This app is available free of charge in the Apple App Store and in Google Play as well. But today we have a wonderful program planned for you, and I am so honored to introduce you to our speaker, Dr. Andrew Evans. Dr. Evans is a hematologist and oncologist at Rutgers Cancer Institute of New Jersey, where he is the Associate Director of Clinical Services. He's also the System Director of Medical Oncology and the Oncology Lead for Combined Medical Group at RWJ Bar Barnabas Health. Additionally, Dr. Evans is the Associate Vice Chancellor for Clinical Innovation and Data Analytics at Rutgers Biomedical and Health Sciences. And last but not least, he is the Chair-Elect of LRF Scientific Advisory Board. We're so happy to have him on this program today. So without further ado, Dr. Evans, I will now turn the talk over to you. I think you're on mute. <laughs> Sorry about that. No worries. It's it's great to be here, and um, I'm just kind of uh, getting the talk prepared. But uh, Hodgkin lymphoma is definitely an interesting entity. It's one that we've known about, actually, for decades. And you may have heard about, in the 1960s, there's been a few um, documentaries done about when chemotherapy and cancer really truly first became curable. Hodgkin lymphoma was one of the very first. It was that and ALL, acute lymphoblastic lymphoma, were really the two where we realized that we can cure cancer. Believe it or not, before the 1960s, um, we could cure cancer, but it was really in the minority of patients. And it was finally figuring out that how do we not just have chemotherapy, but use chemotherapy um, 
really led to some big breakthroughs. So let me share my screen here in a second or the slides. Hopefully you can see those slides. Stop me if you cannot see these slides. I'll put it in the slideshow. Looks good. Thank you. So the first question you may ask is why is it called Hodgkin lymphoma and non-Hodgkin lymphoma? There was a Sir Thomas Hodgkin. That's him right there. He was English in the 1800s. And he wasn't vain enough to name it after himself, but he was the first one to report it in the literature about patients with lymph nodes. They all, none of them survived at the time in the late 1800s, but he was the first to describe it. Pathologist around the year 1900, there was a uh, Dr. Reed and a Dr. Sternberg pathologist who credited Dr. Hodgkin. And it was for, by the way, for almost 75 years, it was called Hodgkin disease. It wasn't known to be related to a lymph node because at the time, you know, science was still emerging and evolving. But ultimately, in about the 1980s and 90s, we realized it came from a lymphocyte and it was then changed from Hodgkin disease to calling it Hodgkin lymphoma. But that is him there. And so we first let's talk about epidemiology and incidence, meaning what causes it. And like many cancers, the honest answer is we don't know what causes it. There's some theories, and there's a lot of research looking at, at it. There are a few clusters, a few familial uh, patterns, so to speak, um, but, but really no smoking guns at this point. Um, there are about 8,000 cases, and just to put that in perspective, that, that's A, for the United States, 8,000 per year. Uh, and B, what about related to non-Hodgkin's? There are over 80,000. So it's about one-tenth as common as, as non-Hodgkin's, but we certainly see it, we understand it, we know about it. I alluded to there's a little bit of a familial association, like uh, brothers and sisters or mother and son and, and things like that. It's, it's not a very high risk, it's a little increased risk. Interestingly, the socioeconomic groups that are more uh, uh, diagnosed with this are ones that are more um, Western European United States and one in more uh, impoverished countries, you don't see Hodgkin lymphoma, which is interesting in, in its own respect. Most cancer, when you talk about how common is it based on age, is pretty linear. And in other words, the older you get, the more likely you are to get breast cancer, lung cancer, colon cancer, et cetera. I'm going to show you the curves here. This is very unique. It's not only that it's most commonly seen in your 20s and 30s, but then it kind of starts to go away in commonality and incidence and comes back a little bit. I'll show you that in a minute. It's a little more common in men versus women. So this is what's called a bimodal, bimodal because it's very unique. There's almost no other cancers that you see a, a curve. It's usually very linear. So you see down here, um, the first spike you could see, and this is per 100,000, so it's not absolute cases, um, but in terms of per 100,000, you see most common in 20s and 30s. doesn't go away, but goes down in your 40s and 50s, and then 70s and 80s, it comes up again, and, and we don't know why, honestly, this is. There's some theories. Is it virus-related or not? But um, interesting, none the spec that respect that we see this. But most patients, because these are all relative curves, and there's more 25 year olds than there are 85 year olds. So another way to say this is 80% of patients we see with Hodgkin lymphoma are below 60. About 20% are over age 60. And just to the point of na um, nationality. And this does point to something in the environment. And so the higher the curves up are the more common that Hodgkin lymphoma is. So this is fascinating. When you look at in the Europe, like Western Europe, especially in the United States, it's pretty similar in common out and in the incidence and how common. It's almost unheard of in Asia. It's really, really uncommon in Asia. But if 
an Asian patient from Asia moves to the United States. So you can see LA Japanese, Los Angeles Chinese, Hawaiian Japanese, their, in, their incidence starts to increase, as you can see, not quite to the level, but it does, it's just called acculturation. That is there something, envir it, it tells you there must be something environmental that's at least part of the puzzle of why this happens, Hodgkin lymphoma that is. Let me just jump right to clinical presentation. Most commonly we see this with lymph nodes. Non-Hodgkin's can go to funny places. It can go to non-lymph node, like you can go to the bone or even the brain and things like that. Hodgkin's rarely does that. It usually stays in the lymph nodes. In fact, the most common is painless, persistent lymph node, enlarging lymph nodes in the neck, in the groin, other areas. Uh, on that. About half of the patients will be what's called limited stage, stage one, two. Sometimes we see it, itching in the absence of rash. It can, can secrete these hormones that, that we don't know why it causes itching. You start treatment and the itching goes away. Um, not, not, a, not a negative factor, just an interesting phenomenon that we see. What about types of Hodgkin's? As anyone, any lymphoma aficionados may know, when we talk about non-Hodgkin's, um, there's more than 80 types of non-Hodgkins. Not so in Hodgkins. There's only five or six types. And they're all, except one on the, the number two over there, mostly all treated the same. These NS, MC stand for different subtypes that the pathologist gives us, but we treat it the same. So remember I mentioned um, Dr. Reed and Dr. Sternberg. So if we biopsied a patient's lymph node, um, actually, and this is also different than non-Hodgkin's, only about 1% will have Hodgkin cells. And sometimes that's why this gets missed when it's only done with a small needle in, in a lymph node. Sometimes you have to take it all out and you have to fish for these cells. Usually in a non-Hodgkin's, like 70% of the lymph node will be composed by the lymphoma cells, but it literally is only 1%. Thankfully, we have good pathologists. And the 1%, it's actually called owl eyes. Look right there right in the middle where I'm drawing. It looks like two owl eyes. These are called Reed-Sternberg cells. So somebody after Dorothy Reed and Dr. Sternberg, um, we call it Reed-Sternberg cells, are those Hodgkin uh, cells that we diagnose. But then it's not just that. Our pathologists are like detectives. They have to fish for it. It's like looking for fingerprints and DNA. One way they look for fingerprints is they stain the cells. And Hodgkin's cells, when you stain the tissue, it kind of lights up brown or red in this case with certain numbers that we look at. We look at certain patterns. Again, it can take a few days for our pathologist to work through this and ultimately give us a diagnosis. But oh, by the way, that's partly why this was called Hodgkin disease for so long is because there's such few cells in, in the actual tissue. But ultimately in the 1990s, scientists um, at our center and others were able to literally micro dissect out these cells because so much of the breakthrough in oncology in the last 20 years and now into the future is really precision medicine. And to do precision medicine, we need to look at these cancer cells and put them under a microscope and look at their DNA and find things to target. So we're able to do that um, over time. And so thankfully now we have a couple breakthroughs in the last few years of targeted treatment to complement the uh, treatability and curability uh, of Hodgkin lymphoma. I normally don't ever show survival curves, but it's so dramatic in Hodgkin lymphoma that I think it's important to show. So in the 1960s, um, could we cure maybe 30% of patients who got high dose whole body radiation? Maybe. Um, but what happened almost overnight in the mid 1960s, because they were only using single chemo drugs, but some very smart, including Dr. DeVita and others, scientists at the National Cancer Institute learned to combine, instead of using three singular chemo drugs, use it together. And it literally almost doubled the cure rate overnight to the point, and even in the 1990s, the higher these numbers are, the higher the cure rate is that even in the 1990s, we knew we could cure 90% of Hodgkin lymphoma patients, which is fantastic. 
So what's the approach to treatment? Well, that first bullet is critical, and that is our goal, cure. That's goal number one A, I'll say. Um, we usually will check the disease. Yes, we want to know the diagnosis. That's always number one. Number two is, well, where is it? And whether it's in one place or 20 places in the body, all curable. Now, you might need more treatment the more places in the body than if it's only in one or two places, but everything's curable in the high majority of patients. We'll check the lung and the heart, partly because I said goal 1A is cure. What's goal 1B? Do no harm. Minimum side effects. And I don't mean just during treatment, but especially since most of our patients are in their 20s and 30s, we don't want to use high dose um, aggressive treatment and cause side effects that they'll have for the rest of their life. So we've been very cognizant, um, um, especially in the last 20 years in our clinical trials, because in some ways they were, they were just happy in the 1970s and 80s, they could cure this. They were giving eight months, 12 months of chemotherapy. And we learned as, well, we don't need that much, maybe just six months or four months or less for certain patients. So a lot of the clinical trials we've done over the last 20 to 30 years has actually been giving less treatment to patients. Now, we still want to maintain that cure rate uh, as a critical component to treatment, but to do so in a smart way. So I mentioned about not doing single chemo. The initial cocktail that was used, we, we have a lot of abbreviations in, in oncology, was called MOP, M-O-P-P. -P. Each letter is a different chemotherapy. Um, we then moved on, um, believe it or not, in the 1970s to something called ABVD, um, well, the reason I said interesting is we still use ABVD every day here. So um, have there been treatments that have tried to beat ABVD, different chemotherapy cocktails? I list a couple. There have. But in the United States and most countries, ABVD has remained the standard in terms of curability and tolerability. And so without getting into exact treatments for um, certain exact disease stage, what I would say is generally for limited stage, which we say is stage one or two, that's when it's in only one or two places in the body versus quote unquote advanced stage where it's in multiple places throughout the body. You can see still the vast majority of patients are cured. You usually will need more chemotherapy, um, six months of it on average for advanced stage versus two to four months for limited stage. Uh, we will, for select patients, consider low-dose radiation um, for, for some patients, whereas advanced stage, it usually is not used. And, and thankfully, in addition to chemo, we had a big breakthrough um, over 10 years ago of the first targeted medicine FDA approved for Hodgkin lymphoma called brentuximab vidotin. Long name, the trade name is called Incetris. You may say, well, what the heck is that? Well, this is a cartoon. It's a targeted therapy because that science that I showed you with those tweezers where they dissected cells, the scientists learn one of the things that at a very submicroscopic level that sticks out of Hodgkin cells is called or labeled CD30. Well, how does that help us? Well, one, it helps us diagnose it, but two, it gives us a target to attach a medication to. Now it's still intravenous, but this is an antibody. Um, now, it's not a cold antibody. What I mean by a cold antibody is you just give the antibody by itself, but you have microscopic pieces of this, this uh, chemotherapy-like agent called MMAE, I won't, uh, monomethyl orostatin E, usually five of them attached to each antibody. And so instead of just giving chemo indiscriminately that floats everywhere in the body and targets everything, it's very targeted. It attaches to the Hodgkin Reed Sternberg cell, this is called, you can see it internalizes, it gets inside it, and then releases the microscopic pieces um, of this chemotherapy antitubulin agent and is much more targeted. And this was initially FDA approved over 10 years ago for patients with relapsed Hodgkin lymphoma. And like many cancers, okay, great. Well, what about newly diagnosed patients? And so there was a very large randomized clinical trial done over five, completed over five years ago. And this showed to be significantly improved when you combined it. Now, the difference is you either do ABVD by itself, or if you give it with brentuximab vidotin, um, you basically replace the Bs. 
So it's a different B, or, or if you use the A for this, it would be A, AVD. And when it was compared head to head, it literally showed improved survival, overall survival, not just less relapses, but literally longer life um, um, comparatively when compared with AAVD. So that's been the standard um, I would submit for several years now, this targeted agent with three chemotherapy, classic chemotherapy drugs, AVD. Well, that's great. And I mentioned this a little bit, especially for patients with early stage, where we're always looking to do less, but maintain. And a lot of that has been on radiation, doing less radiation. We want more novel targeted agents. We want more science, biology. We use PET scans to tell us, can we give less treatment or do we still need to change treatment, give more treatment, et cetera? So sometimes we use a, a PET scan to tell us that. But let me show you an example of, and this is from Dr. Yoholam, who's a radiation oncologist colleague at uh, Memorial Sloan Kettering, a uh, friend of mine. And um, th if this is a, this is a chest X-ray um, of, of a patient, the, the white stuff in the middle is the heart, the, the dark stuff is the lung, but let's say some a patient, the green circles were lymph nodes. And this is as if someone's facing us. So the left hand is, is on the right. So that's the left under the arm axillary and left above the clavicle, supraclavicular. If this patient was seen in the 1960s, the amount of radiation they gave was that much. They didn't know. They knew lymphoma spread through lymph nodes, so they assumed let's just radiate the whole chest. At the time it made sense and they were happy that they could cure some cancers. But as you could imagine, that's a lot of excess radiation going to the heart, going to the right side of the body, going up to the neck, et cetera. And so thankfully, smart um, lymphoma doctors in the 1980s, 90s said, well, wait a minute, can we still have a high cure rate with less radiation? This is called involved field radiation. The other one is extended field. And now you can never assume anything because we wouldn't want to sacrifice cure rate. But the long story short, when clinical trials, which are critical to advance the field, showed that involved field was not only the same cure rate, but as you could imagine, less side effects. And believe it or not, we're, we're even doing this now. Look at that, involved node with only one centimeter around. And this is looking like the same. So in our radiation colleagues, it's very targeted 3D, 4D radiation. Um, and this has been a big breakthrough to, again, maintain high cure, but avoid side effects later in life. Um, such as radiation and chemotherapy can contribute as well. And that's what I want to pivot to now, is talk about, let's say, whether limited, advanced, we've given the best treatment. Um, what about survivorship? Now what? And this is from a big uh, institute of medicine. And read this statement. I, I'm not going to read it out. Is is The long story short is we need to do a better job of this. And we are doing a better job, but we need to study this more. Who has what later effects, whether five years, 10 years, 20 years. And by the way, this is not just Hodgkin lymphoma, it's all cancers. There are late effects from all cancer treatments, not pandemic level late effects, but definitely increased risk of heart disease, uh, lung disease, infections. And we just need to be mindful of it. And there's slight adjustments and extra primary care and, and, and that needs to be done. And so um, sometimes the thyroid, sometimes fertility. I, I mentioned already lung and, and cardiac. And what about just general quality of life? I don't have neuropathy or, or numbness and tingling. And thankfully, there's a lot of these cancer survivorship clinics with experts that are popping up and have popped up, frankly, all over the United States. And if someone has been treated and cured, I would submit they should at least have a one-time consult at a survivorship clinic because they dig into, okay, what treatment, what chemo, what radiation, where in the body, what age, and here's that you should have this cholesterol testing, this cardiac stress testing, here's what we recommend based on best evidence. So survivorship is really, really important. And I'm not gonna perseverate on these. These are different things you can see from radiation, but chemotherapy has some issues later in life that, that are slightly increased as well. And, and by the way, I was talking all about newly diagnosed, 
um, is there, are there a small percent of Hodgkin's where it can come back? The answer is yes. The good news is the first bullet. Yes, you absolutely have a second chance, if not a third chance with Hodgkin's. Some cancers you don't, you either get the first time or not. No, you absolutely, in fact, the majority of patients, if it happens a second time are cured. Now, caveat is you have to give different treatment. And more often than not, that second, there's something called an autologous stem cell transplant that we've been doing for 50 years for different cancers. And are, and is that usually part of the plan for a Hodgkin lymphoma that's come back or relapse? Yes, it is. It's a one-time transplant. Um, and thankfully we can say the, the vast majority are cured. There are also, there is another targeted drug. Now this is only FDA approved currently for relapsed Hodgkin lymphoma. They're called checkpoint inhibitors. These checkpoint inhibitors are fascinating because they're not only approved the same drugs for Hodgkin lymphoma, they're approved for 10 other cancers, melanoma, lung cancer. How do they work? It's fascinating. In the real high level, it is approved, it, it, the way they work is it stimulates or wakes up the patient's own immune system. It's one way cancer, including Hodgkin lymphoma, grows in that it almost creates a force field around it that doesn't let the patient's own immune system, dendritic cell, T cell, macrophage, and especially the T cell, attach and destroy the lymphoma. So it basically reinvigorates the patient's own immune system. And it literally is not chemotherapy. And, and currently, as alluded here, it is approved for um, uh, relapsed Hodgkin lymphoma, two agents. Are we studying this in the frontline setting? Yes, we are, um, but still not FDA approved. So that's my quick summary. Um, we've learned a lot about this as scientifically. We, well, we've known about it as I showed in since the 1800s, Sir Thomas Hodgkin, but a ton of scientific knowledge in the last 20 to 30 years. And I, you can see I still have HD sometimes for Hodgkin disease. It should be HL, Hodgkin lymphoma. Early stage, advanced stage, majority are cured, but we want our cake and eat it too. We want a 1A cure and 1B, do it with targeted treatment, less than the amount of chemotherapy or radiation. Yes, we want more science. We want to do PET scans. We want these targeted agents more and more, of course. Um, and at the end of the day, cure, and then make sure we monitor really. And by the way, survivorship is the whole life that we want to maintain it five years, 10 years, 20 years, 30 years, however amount of time after, um, not only as patients uh, get older, but as time goes on, we get more and more information how to do a better job at that. And so I'll say uh, thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Evans. Um, we are going to get into questions now. Uh, so anyone who still has questions, please submit those through the Q&A box on your screen. Uh, we've also already submitted, uh, we've already received a few questions, so we'll just jump into those. Um, so starting off with the first question here, if a patient has had and recovered from non-Hodgkin lymphoma, what is the likelihood that they could get Hodgkin lymphoma later in life? How related are the two diseases and does having one increase the chance of having the other? So yeah, all good questions. The answer to the last one is, is just generally speaking, no, there's not an increased risk of one or the other. With a, with a There's always caveats. With the little caveat is any treatment for any cancer, um, especially if there's radiation included, but even with chemotherapy, there's always a slight increased risk of what we call secondary cancers. But when we say secondary cancers, um, it can be, and you, if you had non-Hodgkin's or Hodgkin's, it can be breast cancer, colon cancer, prostate cancer. Is lymphoma a secondary cancer? It is. So it's not so much like there's a link and an increased risk of one or the other. And, and I don't want to uh, stir, stir the pot at all. It's not a highly increased risk. It's a slight of these secondary cancers. In other words, it might be something instead of, uh, for example, one in nine in every uh, women will have breast cancer. Uh, it might be two and nine of uh, non-Hodgkin's or Hodgkin survivor or 1.5 and nine. So a little bit increased risk and maybe there needs to be different strategy depending on the treatment, was there radiation in the chest area given or or not and, and things like that. But um, in terms of 
how si they're very they're similar in that they're cancers of the lymphocyte and that yes we use chemotherapy so there's kind of like similar similar big picture paradigms but the actual targeted drugs we use like the checkpoint inhibitors and brentuximab vidotin are only approved for Hodgkin lymphoma whereas for for the non-Hodgkin lymphoma we have a whole host of other targeted drugs so they are different enough where the especially when it comes to targeted treatments, even the chemotherapy cocktails are a little different that we use. So some similarities, but when it comes down to treatment and things like that are definite key differences. Thank you. Our next question here is, are there any new drugs that are on track for approval for Hodgkin lymphoma patients? Yeah, there are, I, for sure. I alluded to those checkpoint inhibitors. They're already approved for relapse. Where they're being studied is newly diagnosed that's um, that's out there uh, ongoing as we speak in terms of a large advanced stage clinical trial. There's an ongoing study in limited stage across the whole United States where we're trying to not only add checkpoint inhibitors and brentuximab vidotin for stage one and two, but cut the chemotherapy in half. So we're really excited about that clinical trial. It's called, a, it has letters and a number, AHOD 2131. But the pediatrics are doing it, the adult groups, the whole United States is, is doing that clinical trial. Beyond that, there are some that we're looking at. You may have heard of what's called CAR-T. Um, that's FDA approved for multiple no, different non-Hodgkin's lymphomas. We are looking at CAR-T and Hodgkin's and, and a few other treatments as well. Right. Um, our next question here is, are there lifestyle recommendations for intense chemotherapy regimens to help combat neuropathy or other side effects? Yeah, um, I would say yes, although the, the detailed answer to that is, as you can imagine, fairly individualized. Um, the, there's general lifestyle recommendations. Um, now, during chemotherapy versus after chemotherapy, it's going to be a little different. Obviously, during chemotherapy, um, you know, even though many of our patients will still work or go to school on a, a part-time basis, uh, obviously, you have to be cautious of infections is the biggest caution during chemotherapy. Thankfully, neuropathy is, at least in younger patients, not as common. There isn't so much a lifestyle way to reduce that. We have supportive care measures in terms of different, at least for the infections, we can give immune stimulating shots. There's some antibiotics we can give. There are some neuropathy medications. They don't work fantastic, and we usually only use them if we have to. What's really critical is just constant communication of the patient with their nurses and doctors if they are experiencing side effects. Sometimes patients don't want to you know, disappoint their doctor. They might not say something. We say, no, please have a vivid, vibrant conversation. And because we don't know why that some patients have more side effects than others. And because our you could argue our the way we dose chemotherapy for most cancers is just based on someone's height and weight. And so some patients might not tolerate it. And we might need to give a little lower dose for certain patients. And it's really, well, I would just say, very important to stay ahead of those side effects and make those reductions or add in some, whether it's uh, additional therapy or maybe in some cases, some integrative therapy. There hasn't been a certain supplement or vitamin that's broken through, um, although there are some, some anecdotes on that. But just really great communication uh, between the provider and per, um, including nursing and the patient. Thank you. Up next is, what are your treatment thoughts uh, for a 12-year-old with nodular lymphocyte predominant Hodgkin lymphoma stage two? Yeah, good question. I'm probably going to have to punt that one. One, being an adult oncologist, I usually just go down to 18. Mm -hmm. um, now, I could say how to treat an 18-year-old, but why, why it's hard to give a recommendation is it really depends on where exactly in the body and other things. Um, obviously, that would be a little more for a pediatric oncologist um, on that. And what I would say with lymphocyte predominant Hodgkin's, you have a few different options. Usually for Hodgkin's, it's a little more straightforward, and it's not a bad thing for lymphocyte predominant, but sometimes we'll do radiation by itself. Sometimes we'll do chemotherapy plus radiation. Sometimes we'll just do rituximab antibody. So you have a few different, in a good way, options. And as you might imagine, it gets very individualized 
um, at the patient level. Thank you anyway. Um, and next up here is what are some factors that increase your risk of developing Hodgkin lymphoma? And is there a link between having an autoimmune disease like cel celiac disease and developing Hodgkin lymphoma? The second part first, not really, not that we can see. There certainly with autoimmune diseases, is it slightly, slightly increased risk of non-Hodgkin lymphoma and, and certain non-Hodgkin lymphomas? Again, not like everyone with celiac is going to develop lymphoma. Is it instead of non-Hodgkin's, let's say it's, and again, these are just like really crude estimates. And someone without celiac, um, it might be just generic general person on the street, healthy, no diseases might be a risk of like one in a uh, hundred or 150 will get lymphoma. It might be three in 150 with celiac, something like that. So yes, it's a little increased risk, but still the vast minority will not develop it, but it's always good, obviously, to counsel, um, you know, obviously tell your doctors the medical history, because if God forbid someone developed lymph nodes, maybe they'd have a little shorter leash to be able to do a biopsy or, or do inter interventions on that. But yeah, we don't, we really, there are real no strong risk factors. It's fascinating for Hodgkin lymphoma. Um, that whether it's virus or treatment or, or other factors. And that's why it's obviously, we, I talked a lot about the re, uh, research being done on treatment. We still need a lot more and thankfully it's being done. It's harder research to do that so-called epidemiology, but for Hodgkin's and others, I, there, there's a real unmet need to do more and more research on what causes it. Thank you. Our next question here. Is my uncle just finished lung cancer? He had radiation and chemo. His oncologist stated that she wanted to do a one-year maintenance for him. This maintenance is to clean up the destruction of the broken cancer cells. Is there something similar for Hodgkin lymphoma? Yeah, there is. Um, although not, not as much as other cancers, um, it's actually done a lot in non-Hodgkin's with a medication called rituximab. <laughs> so there's kind of one scenario that we do maintenance treatment because the way the FDA approves medications is for a certain situation and a certain cancer subtype. So actually that medication, Brentuximab Vidotin, is FDA approved also for patients who, uh, remember I mentioned relapsed Hodgkin lymphoma and you receive a stem cell transplant. So what's approved for, for certain patients, not all relapsed patients, but for certain slightly higher risk patients to give one year of Brentuximab Vidotin once a month after the transplant. And so that is still something that, that we do. We're looking at it in other, with other medications and other situations, but for Hodgkin's, that's really the only maintenance. Okay, thank you. Our next question here is what genetic testing, if any, is relevant for this type of lymphoma? Yeah, there really isn't right now. Yeah, not partly because it's more rare and, and less common, but also partly we haven't really found a smoking gun genetic link yet. And it's not for lack of trying. And and I think it's still uh, something we're doing. But yeah, this would not be one for uh, that there's genetic testing. Thank you. Next up here is if, you know, if you've never had a survivorship clinic consultation, where do you find a list of recommended certified clinics? Yeah. It's it's a good question, and and because there's really the certified part is there's nothing that really certifies it. What I would say is um, probably start with our good friend Google or or other search mechanisms. But if you put in cancer survivorship, my expectation would be where you live there should be things popping up. Now we have to be careful not that there's false advertisement. There's different layer levels of survivorship clinic. And I wouldn't say they're good or bad, just different levels of expertise. Usually at the big academic medical centers, like for example, here at Rutgers, we have a dedicated, there's a pediatric survivorship clinic and an adult now survivorship clinic who that's physician led. And so these are patients who have finished their chemotherapy or radiation or, or treatment years in the past, and whether two years, five years, 10 years. Um, but they're really, and there's some are nurse driven, which is fine. Uh, in some ways, I would say something is better than nothing in terms of survivorship. But usually um, the clinics don't advertise that unless they have a dedicated effort. 
for survivorship. And so most cancer centers, if, if they don't have it listed, they probably don't have that expertise. But um, I do. I would do your research. I, I don't. Does L, I don't know if LRF has any resources on on this front. Maybe that's something we could work on to give patients a more uh, detailed listing of of such uh, options of survivorship. Yeah, absolutely. And I think um, I would recommend that this patient talk to our helpline, and I'm sure they would be happy to help you with the search um, in any way that they. Yeah, can. I want to give a big kudos to the helpline at LRF because that's exactly what they do. They help. And they help at all all ends of this, all spectrums. So this, we're talking about survivorship, but God forbid, let's say someone's newly diagnosed. LRF will help you find top lymphoma centers, clinical trials. Um, and then during treatment, they have um, apps and things to help guide guide you, guide patients, guide families through the treatment. And, and obviously great webinars like this for education. Absolutely. Thank you. Um... And if anyone wants to jot the number down, it's always on lymphoma.org everywhere, but it's 800-500-9976, or you can email helpline at lymphoma.org. And our next question here is, I had CHL2B six months after finishing six cycles of ABVD, ABD. I had uptake of 1.3 centimeters on my right hilar lymph node in the mediastinum. Duvel score of four, does this mean uh, a recurrence of Hodgkin lymphoma? These are detailed, amazing questions. Mm -hmm. So that's a tough one. Um, but the reason that's an important and good question is, mm -hmm. is that it definitely does not mean it's recurring Hodgkin lymphoma. Um, you know, if we did a CAT scan on Hope and I or anyone else, assuming we didn't have lymphoma, we might have slightly enlarged lymph nodes. Lymph nodes, a normal lymph node is one to 1.5 centimeters. And so it's, and not to minimize 1.3, um, but did someone have a cold recently? Uh, you always have to be cautious of that. Now, if something read as all of a sudden one and now it's five centimeters, that's different. That would be a little bit more of a red flag. Uh, to me, um, and even if a PET scan was done, you have to be careful because you get false positives. Someone could have a cough and the PET scan, you know, a cold, a pneumonia, and the PET scan would light up positive. So definitely scans do not diagnose lymphoma or, or any cancer for that matter. So it's something that would be in the context if it was an isolation and labs are perfect, patient feels great, because um, that would be a hard biopsy, it probably would need to be followed with not immediate intervention. If God forbid it continued to increase, um, then, then probably a biopsy or something would need to be done at that point. Thank you. Uh, up next here is how is the checkpoint inhibitor treatment administered? Typically how much and how often before you determine if this option works? Yeah, it's intravenous. And depending if you give it by itself as a single agent, either of them, there's two that are approved, is every three weeks. Um, there are some studies giving it with chemotherapy like the ABVD is every two weeks. So we would give it with that. Um, usually, yeah, it's not quite like with chemotherapy, you know, within one dose of certainly two doses, it starts, I guess, the upside of chemotherapy. It can sometimes take a couple doses, but for sure by the second, if not the third dose, you start to see the beneficial effect of, of the lymph node shrinking. Okay. Up next here is, can you talk about treatment for NLPHL for a 40-year-old male? I am currently on active monitoring. I had two PET scans in three months months with no with minimal to no change in size in pelvic lymph nodes, inguinal and iliac, and no change in a, spe a spleen lesion. Uh, my blood work is normal. Yeah, and when I was describing the case of for the 12-year-old, I, I had mentioned three options. There is a fourth option, which is observation. And it's interesting. And and by the way, even though we've called it for 50 plus years, nodular lymphocyte predominant Hodgkins. There's some classifications that are starting to change the name of this to just B cell lymphoma. Because, like follicular lymphoma, non Hodgkins, there are many patients, um, and we frankly don't know why, who might have a diagnosis, but it's small, they feel well, and it stays small for years, sometimes a, a decade or more. And, and so, more indolent, uh, more slow growing. There's not a test that tells us who's going to be slow growing or indolent versus not. It really is test of time um, with that. 
And so there's no right answer whether someone should be observed or have rituxan or treatment. That obviously is a personalized um, and very individualized discussion. But I think that's great. If nothing's changing over uh, three months, uh, that's that's fantastic. And it's just kind of following it carefully over time. And and I wouldn't keep getting a PET scan, by the way, every three months. That's a little excessive. Usually we would change to office visits every three months and at most scans every six months. Okay, thank you. Um, our next patient here writes, what does end of life look like with someone for someone with lymphoma? This is a second attempt to rid myself of lymphoma. I'm currently on rituxan every eight weeks and I've been for the past year. I'm 73 and I'm consistently fatigued. I'm tired and I'm thinking about stopping treatment. Yeah, that's a that's a very sensitive topic, as you as you might imagine. And and that's even though I, I think the, the 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 situation sounds like non-Hodgkins, we use rituximab and non-Hodgkins. It's never impossible for, for any cancer for that to happen. And I, I would I would make sure to have a very open discussion with your oncologist. Um, uh, even though these are all incredibly treatable, many are curable, you know, nothing's 100%. And so I, I would say, hopefully there's an open and honest conversation about, um, about what are the treatment options. You know, for everything we do at any point, our hope and expectation is um, that whatever, if we're recommending a treatment, that the benefits outweigh the risks. Um, now, could it ever shift? In, in in the spectrum of, of a clinical case, it can. But um, yeah, I, I think that's how to make sure to talk to, to your specialist, maybe get a second opinion. Um, really, second opinion should not hurt. And most 98% of doctors' egos are not hurt with that. They understand um, on that. And so just to get another perspective, because a lot of this is, is no right answer and to just to get good information. Thank you so much. Next up here is, would you recommend BEA, COPP, chemotherapy without bleomycin, or would you consider it too risky? Yeah, BEA-COP is, is interesting. If any of us right now were in Germany and diagnosed with advanced stage lymphoma, the national standard, and Germany's done some of the best research over the last 30 plus years in Hodgkin lymphoma. They're like the world leaders. They use a lot of BEA-COP. It it's a little controversial because it is stronger. They think it's better. Um, so they use it in everyone. If we use it in the U.S., it's only for certain situations. Um, usually the situation, if we use it, would be not at the beginning. Most centers and lymphoma experts would not use it. It would only be if we recheck a scan and it's not going away as fast as we would like. So maybe we'll, because it's a little more intense, than ABVD, um, but no, uh, the bleomycin is actually a lower dose in BIACOP than it is on ABVD. The issue is just the whole regimen is a little stronger. So um, usually if it's used in the United States, it's for that select situation where on a PET scan, it's just not going away fast enough that we'll just kick it up a notch. And, and in that select situation, use BIACOP. Okay, thank you. Next up here is, have you seen any link between the age at which a person person is diagnosed and treated for Hodgkin's and the likelihood of relapse, i.e. the younger the age at time of diagnosis, the higher the chance of relapse? So the quick answer is yes, but it's actually the opposite, um, as you might imagine. In other words, um, the older a Hodgkin lymphoma patient, and don't like to compare too much, but if we compared a 25-year-old with a 75 year old, the still curable, still curable in all patients, regardless of age, but it might be a little less curable than in, in the, especially over age 60, 70, 80. And as you might imagine, one of the reasons is just tolerability of treatment. So that's the bad news. The good news is we're doing a lot of, we have, the, uh, we, we do, we've done here in, in the country and the world working together on this, a lot of clinical trials specifically for older Hodgkin lymphoma patients. It's actually an unmet need in all cancers because we can't, as you might imagine, treat someone identically if they're 75 and 25. We need to adapt it a little bit and you know, maybe gentler, more mild chemotherapy, more targeted medicine. 
And so we're doing a, a lot of research in that area. And, and just in the last 10 years, it, it looks like the cure rate for older patients, maybe not as quite as good for younger, but has really come up quite a bit. And but we need we need more research because not every, as you could imagine, 75 year old is the same. Uh, there might be more fit or unfit, and we need to adapt within within one certain age, not just comparing older to younger. So um, yes, it's a little harder to treat older, but thankfully the, these really age tailored regimens are are becoming more and more. And so um, important research to continue. Thank you. Next up here is: Does NLPHL do NLPHL patients respond well to chemotherapy? Well, I need to make sure to talk more about lymphocyte predominant mm -hmm. the next time because that's what this. Yeah, this um, it does, it does. But NLP nodule lymphocyte predominant Hodgkin's is it's like in the middle. You know, we have it used to be always lumped with Hodgkin's, but in the last ten years, we're realizing it actually is more like non-Hodgkin's. It actually, NLPHL is more like non-Hodgkin's. We really have most cases than Hodgkin's. So the paradigms are more similar to non-Hodgkin's than Hodgkin's. So those are those paradigms I was talking about that not one right answer, that it could be nothing for like just clinical observation. Someone does great for many years. It could be rituximab by itself. It could be radiation by itself. It could be chemotherapy, it does respond to chemotherapy. The question is, does everyone need chemotherapy? Some do, some don't. And that's the individualized nature of lymphocyte predominant, but also continued good research ongoing for that specific subtype. Thank you. And building on that question, uh, what are the risks of NLPHL transforming to an aggressive non-Hodgkin lymphoma? I hear 7% in 10 years and 30% in 20 years. Yeah, it's it's um it's something like that. Those those numbers, in other words, and and that actually because that doesn't happen in Hodgkin's. That's a non-Hodgkin's thing. Like for example, follicular lymphoma, and it, the most common indolent non-Hodgkin's lymphoma has about a one at most a two percent risk per year to transform to a more aggressive uh, B cell lymphoma but usually that kind of plateaus at like um, 20 years at 30%. So it's like it keeps going up. Same thing for lymphocyte predominant. It's about a one to 2% per year. So that's always something the doctor should be thinking about that. Um, well, hopefully it doesn't come back uh, if, if it's treated, but if it comes back just to make sure it hasn't transformed because that would be a different treatment. Hey, and it looks like this will be our last question for today. Once you're diagnosed, is there a way of telling how long you've had Hodgkin lymphoma? I had mild symptoms for a long time before they intensified and I was diagnosed. Yeah, there really isn't. Unless someone had like random CAT scans or PET scans done for other reasons, you really can't. Um, uh, and the reason I say that is I've had patients um, who did have random CAT scans and they might have had like just in one little spot for several months, and then it was ultimately picked up. And then I've had other patients who they had a random CAT scan clean, and like three months or even six weeks later, it's in 10 places. And so usually though, Hodgkin's isn't like that second example. It's usually um, kind of over months that it takes um, to appear, I would see, can we say years? Nothing's impossible. That'd be a little uncommon. It's usually months. But importantly, importantly, um, because uh, a patient I saw recently, um, a 20-year-old, the parents were were upset that they said, oh, did we not recognize this early enough? We should have diagnosed this earlier. It's our fault. It isn't. It isn't. It's kind of one of those that, you know, we don't know why it happens, as we've said, but but if it happens, at least we know about it, we can cure it. And what I can also say, and this has been looked at, um, whether we treat it this week, two weeks ago, two weeks from now, same cure rate, same cure rate. Of course, you'd like to pick things up a little earlier because you can get less treatment, but same cure rate. We just like, as you can imagine, we'd like to diagnose it earlier because the longer it can go, it might start to cause symptoms. We'd like almost to pick it up when it's asymptomatic, you could say, just enlarging lymph nodes and no other symptoms, but it's not any less curable. 
Great. Thank you so much, Dr. Evans, uh, for your time today, for your excellent presentation, and for answering all these questions. Um, and I want to thank everyone also for joining today's call and for asking such great questions. Um, I want to thank our sponsors again, uh, Genentech and CGen, for, for supporting our program today and making it possible. Please remember, if anyone attending has any additional questions, you can always reach out to our helpline. Again, that number is 800-500-9976 or helpline at lymphoma.org. But with that, thank you so much again, Dr. Evans. All right, take care, everyone. Have a great rest of your day.